On the day that I die, I'll have peace of mind when I tend to my garden and my limbs harden. And hey, it's Brandon, and we're back with another episode of the Changeville Podcast. Hope you've enjoyed the panels that we've shared over the last few weeks uh, and months, I guess, at this point. I hope you got something out of them, because we certainly got a lot out of them. I personally still think about that uh, that allyship panel. It, it kind of changed some of my views on how I live my own life, which is, I think, an amazing thing to be able to say about any sort of panel that you're able to listen to, that you walk away with something that changes you. If you had any kind of impact like that from listening to those panels, let us know. Hit us up on social media, send us a tweet, Facebook, you know, uh, we'd love to hear about it. This week's episode of the Changeville podcast is a little bit uh, different. It's a little bit special. It's the first of, we hope, uh, many interviews featuring... Dylan Klempner. Dylan is one of the artists in residence at UF Shan's Arts in Medicine program, and he is 100% passionate about combining arts and compassion and highlighting those who do the same. And so he has joined our team as an interviewer for this podcast and has interviewed Michael Clater. Uh, another artist in residence at UF Health Shan's Arts in Medicine. He's going to go over more about himself and Michael, so I'm just going to let him take it away from here uh, with the this week's episode of the Changeville Podcast featuring Michael Clater, interviewed by Dylan Klempner. My name is Dylan Klempner, and today on the Changeville podcast, we're speaking with Michael Clater, a singer-songwriter from Gainesville, Florida. Michael also works as a musician in residence in the UF Health Shands Arts and Medicine program, and we're honored to have him on the, on the show today. My first question is one uh, that we'll return to, but I just want to uh, get your initial thoughts on the following. Um, as you may know, Changeville is a festival that showcases and connects people who use the arts for self-awareness and social change. Um, when you think of art, music, and performing, combined with ideas of self-awareness and social change, what are the first, first things that come to mind related to your practice as a musician? I think music is a really important thing for people as individuals and the way that we r- relate to it reflects the way that we relate to the world and can also change change how we relate to the world. So you say that our that music is important for individuals. It's it's sort of a part of every everyday life. And and I know that you're somebody who is particularly attracted to uh like folk singers and singer-songwriters, particularly from like the 1970s. And so we think about people who were commenting on a particular environment that they were experiencing, like in the early 70s, late 60s, in response to like the Vietnam War. Can you speak a little bit about maybe name some of those musicians from that time that you admire and maybe how their approach to music in connection with the larger societal issues that they were commenting on might also uh, say something about how you write music. Sure, yeah. I resonate with songs in a lot of different ways, and part of what, probably one of the main things that grabs me about a song is if there's a, if there's a good story to it. And when I'm writing songs, I always try, it's, it's actually hard for me to write songs that don't tell like a full story beginning middle and end otherwise I I get lost in like this nebulous like non-narrative you know um and so that's what draws me into a song and when you can use a story to to kind of like get at a bigger message that's um that's what I resonate with the most and uh um there's a lot of people that do it one of my favorite songwriters is is Paul Simon and he's um he's like kind of a, a classic example of a guy who can like tell a story and get at a bigger picture um, with songs like, uh, like 
um, America is one of my favorite Simon and Garfunkel songs. And it kind of tells like the story of these travelers and it's kind of like gets at the like melting pot nature of, of New York city. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's a, I think that's a, that's a good way to, to get a message across narrative. Yeah. So that's actually a good transition into, uh, maybe backing up a little bit and talking about your personal narrative. You're originally from Florida. Is that right? That's right. Born and raised. I grew up outside of Orlando, uh, kind of near Winter Park, Maitland area, and I moved to Gainesville in 2005. Were you interested in music prior to moving to Gainesville, or was it something you've kind of done all your life? I've actually, I've kind of always identified myself as a musician. I, I started playing drums in sixth grade, but I already like felt like I loved music before that. And then uh, I picked up a guitar for the first time it, when I was 17 or 18, I was in a band playing drums and uh, I wanted to write songs. So I picked up a more uh, melodic instrument, something I could structure a song with. When did you start writing music? Um, when you first started playing or what, did that come later? Yeah, I, I picked up a guitar for the first time in order to start writing music. So I could barely play when I wrote my first song and it's it shows when you listen back to it. <laughs> Who were some of your uh, early influences, uh, was it, was there a particular uh, musician that you listened to at that time when you first picked up a guitar and said, I mean, a lot of times as artists, we're like, we're inf influenced by somebody, uh, and that kind of changes the trajectory of how we want to practice our art. And I wonder if that's true for you. Yeah. I mean, uh, definitely. Um, I kind of, uh, always identified with the like finger style guitar singer songwriter types you know like I uh, I grew up and my my mom listened to a lot of James Taylor and artists like that and it kind of informed my style a little bit because I automatically I never used a pick I never wanted to use a pick I always thought there was more you could do you have five picks on your hand already so why not use them? You can do more with a guitar with all your fingers. I mean, I could at least. But those were my, my main influence were those kind of singer songwriters and also the people I was surrounded with. It was it was uh, not always famous musicians, but just my friends. Those were the people that were teaching me things. And uh, you know, naturally, that's kind of the style that I learned. So where did you go to college? I went to UF. Did you play music when you were a student here in Gainesville at uh, as a as a student at UF? Yes, I was more musician than student, I think. <laughs> it took me uh, five years to graduate with a philosophy degree. I, I wasn't, uh, I liked school, but um, school for me was a, was a more, in retrospect, it was more of a way to meet people and, and learn how to play music and learn how to play music together with people and be exposed to different kinds of music and different writers. And uh, I learned way more about music than I ever learned about philosophy. That's, that's for sure. Being a philosophy major, have you incorporated any ideas from that into your songs? Or? I used to really want that from my songs. I used to think that was a really good high-minded thing to do. It felt like something you should do with songs was to you know, like incorporate big philosophical principles. But the more, the more I write, the more I, I tend toward more, um, human stories. And there's, you know, there's always going to be like big messages built into that because that's, that's what it, stories do, but it's never like, Oh, here's a, here's a song about existentialism or something. You know, it's, it's more like a, a storytelling song and people can interpret it with, or filter it through whatever belief system they already have. One of the genres of music that I think is particularly philosophical that you've gravitated towards is the Western. <laughs> um, and I mean, there's definitely a history in recognizing the Western, particularly in the cinema, taking a philosophical perspective on American history and the kind of expansionism ideas of the West and things like that. And you seem to take a really interesting approach with your music and you've done some performances. Can you talk a little bit about why you gravitated toward writing Westerns and what you think, is there anything relevant about the Western idea of like the idea of the West in the context of the Western for the particular time that we're in right now? First of all, who doesn't love Westerns? <laughs> um, 
I I found myself in a big Western kick, um, almost obsession, a couple of years back, and just I was reading novels and watching documentaries and reading nonfiction and just couldn't get enough of it. But the thing that I love about writing like fictional westerns and even even like you know hearing the nonfiction stories is that you get like such a clear picture. Well, it's not a clear picture. So what it is is it's like a, there there's like this overarching thing of like good versus evil, which is in a lot of styles. But um, in westerns, it's it's not always clear cut. There's like a lawlessness, and you know the outlaw can become the sheriff uh, because he's the toughest guy in town. And so, when you're writing from that perspective, a lot of times, like whoever is the narrator in in whatever song or work you're writing is like automatically becomes the good guy because that's who's telling the story and that's whose side of the story you're getting. But then you can flip it and easily have the other guy be the good guy. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a little more, instead of having your traditional, like good and evil, anyone could be anything, which feels more human. It's very rare that you find someone who's just pure evil or just pure good. Like everybody's a little bit of both. And that is still true today. <laughs> it seems kind of counterintuitive, but in some ways, Westerns have this way of helping us empathize with bad guys in a way. I'm thinking about John Wayne, like in the movie The Searchers, where he's kind of this outlaw, but he's also kind of a good guy and you're rooting for him. Is that is that some of what you're trying to get at? Definitely. And the Western genre has a lot of room for that, where there's like, yeah, some guy is an outlaw because he did this one little thing wrong. But really, when you look at like the grand scope of his life, he's he's like a, a righteous vigilante type, you know, where he's like doing good in general and maybe has made a couple of mistakes along the way, which like, you know, who can't relate to that? Absolutely. And it seems like there's room for kind of redemption that idea actually brings me to one of your songs, Birth of an Outlaw. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what went into writing that song and some of the ideas that went into writing that song? Yeah, that was the first um, Western song that I actually wrote. And uh, I wrote it all in, in one night, and then I woke up and finished the rest of it the next morning. Um, it was kind of like, a, you know, that almost never happens to me, like a rush of inspiration. It's just like I can't, my hand can't write fast enough, you know? Um, but that's uh, that's kind of like exactly what I was talking about. So the the story is that you have this guy who is whose father was was murdered by this outlaw, and he goes to seek revenge against the outlaw that killed his dad. Meanwhile, the outlaw is al is already dead, but the outlaw has a son. So the narrator of the song decides, well. I'll adopt this guy's son, and then that will be my way of getting revenge, is that when this kid gets old enough, then we'll fight it out, and I'll tell him what happened. Um, but about, you know, halfway, three-quarters of the way through the song, uh, the narrator starts questioning himself, like, what am I doing to this kid? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of wrecking this kid's life in revenge for what his father did, and starts to second-guess himself, and... Uh, you know, by the end of the song, he ends up dying, and the kid becomes now he's he's the outlaw. That's the birth of the outlaw is that he raised this kid with bad intentions, and it's no wonder that the kid turns out bad. But if you heard it from the kid's perspective, it's like I was saying, if you heard it from the kid's perspective, you would like think that the dad was the bad guy all along. Yeah, it's kind of a there's a lot to it. <laughs> The killer's bloody pulse is through his face. Yeah, it's a powerful song. I, the first time I heard it, I was actually kind of moved. This idea of revenge and and where that actually gets anyone mm -hmm. um, was one thing that I took away from it. Revenge is a dangerous road. I think you've said at some point that you travel to China. I was, I've was i kind of been curious about that and how that may have impacted your work as a musician or just as kind of a human being to experience another culture. Was that something you did as a student in college or did you do that after college? Uh, I traveled to China after college. I went twice. I went Once I had a, a friend living there and I went to go visit him and then also travel with my now wife, we uh, we traveled around for two months in China, and being in another culture is just uh, a really important thing to do. 
it's uh, infectious, you know. We were there for two months, and I immediately wanted to go back. I, I came home and studied Chinese, and I, I thought that the first time what was missing from our experience was that um, I didn't speak the language, and it was hard to communicate with people, and that was the main thing that I was wanting to do while I was there was communicate with people. It was the, you know, the scenery is beautiful, and there's lots of cultural experiences you can have, but really the best way to appreciate a culture is to meet the people there and, and talk to them. So I came home and studied Chinese and, uh, I was, I was a working musician at the time. I had all day, every day to, you know, practice my Chinese characters and, and learn Chinese. And so I, I learned as much as I could in a year and I went back and, and it was really an enriching experience to get to meet people and make friends and, and speak, you know, a little bit of the language at least and really deepen the experience. Why did you Why did you end up going to China to to begin with? You said it was originally to just visit a friend who was there, and it was mostly to travel. And there's, um, and I had some connections through my friend to to play some music along the way, and you know subsidize the trip a little bit, and uh, and that sure made it easier financially <laughs> to take two months off to travel the first time, and then four months off to travel the second time. It was. Uh, made it a little easier to be able to make a little money along the way. Did you find that the Chinese were open to your music? It was interesting because there were two kinds of gigs that we played. We played, you know, pretty normal gigs like like what I would play here in in the States. Um, You know, coffee shops and bars and restaurants where people are appreciating the music at face value, like what I'm wanting them to appreciate about the music. And then there were other gigs that were more corporate gigs that... um, paid a lot better for one thing, but also the only reason they had you there was because you were American and that was a status thing. Like this establishment wants to show that they're upscale and international. So they have an American musician, which is a very weird experience. It feels, uh, you know, on, on one hand, like I, I knew what I was getting into. I, everyone kind of explained to me like what it was going to be. I knew that I was in some sense being exploited for where I'm from, but, um, and like, you know, how I look and the color of my skin and, and that I knew how to play take me home country road. <laughs> and, um, and, but on the other hand, uh, you know, it paid a lot of money and, and it, it was a very strange experience, but, uh, but you know, that's like another, another real cultural experience that I got to have that now I carry with me. <laughs> so you've done this traveling um, and I'm, I'm wondering how that may have informed your perspective of, uh, of home of Florida. Cause I know you also incorporate lands images of landscape. It seems as though Florida plays a, a role. I mean, you've participated in the Cypress sessions. Can you say a little bit about how Florida might be an influence? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I don't think I really appreciated Florida for what it is until I, I traveled. Um, there, were, there was a good uh, two years where I spent a lot of time traveling around the U.S. and also in China uh, on those two trips. Um, and it was really after like my now wife and I, we, we toured around the United States for four months playing shows here and there. And, and, you know, half of it was, was just a road trip and half of it was to play music. But when we got back to Florida, we were both, we were both struck by how beautiful it is here and how we'd never really appreciate it. Like really when you cross the Georgia border into Florida, it's like a kind of green that you don't see around the country. It's such a beautiful place. And I also think that growing up around Orlando, where I grew up, there was there wasn't quite the emphasis on the environment and outdoors and and being outside and appreciating nature like there is in Gainesville. And so since I've moved to Gainesville, now it's been almost 13 years since I've lived here. Definitely spend a lot more time outside appreciating Florida for what it is. I totally agree. Um, Gainesville seems like a special part of Florida that many people don't experience if they just kind of go to the coasts. I wanted to touch on, well, you recently organized a songwriting challenge in response, I think after the election. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about that? Is it still open to, I know you for a while you were taking you were asking songwriters to submit pieces. Are you still yeah, so calling, having submissions? Right. So the, uh, the original idea was to, uh, 
the original idea came about for me when I was I was driving around one day and listening to the news on the radio and at the time it was right after the election at the time it was uh it was so ubiquitous like everybody was talking about the election and it was deflating and demoralizing and I was really bummed out about it and uh and angry I mean I think a lot of people were angry it just seemed impossible and and now here we are but um, I was driving around one day listening to the news on the radio, and uh, I turned it off, and I was like, I, I thought I have to like put my energy toward something that's actually positive and productive and creative. I sent out um, kind of a call to to a bunch of musician friends saying, like, let's write some songs in response to this. And there was an idea to make an album about it, and it never quite came to fruition, but a lot of people wrote a lot of really great songs and I think there was a lot of good energy put toward it. And, uh, I know for me, it was a huge release. I've talked to a few other people who said it, it was too. It's uh, I, I still find myself writing about it every now and then. And it's, um, it's still going on. <laughs> I also know that you work with UF health Shan's arts and medicine program. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that if that's okay. Yeah, great. Can you say a little bit about how working, first of all, how you got started and maybe how working there, has, working at the hospital has impacted your life and career in some way? Yeah, I got started, um, like a lot of people, with arts and medicine by volunteering here and there and um, and eventually was, was hired as a musician in residence. Um, it's been four and a half years since I started working there and it's been... Uh, an amazing rewarding experience i mean <laughs> how many musicians get to like go around and meet people all day and play songs for them and it's in the hospital it's in a place where people people need something we probably should provide a little context i think um and maybe just explain on a real simple way what it is that you guys do yeah i'm a i'm a musician in residence with the uf health shans arts and medicine program which mostly means that i i go around and play music for patients in the hospital and it's a it's a it's a different thing you know I, I've been a, a musician for a long time playing in bars and restaurants and clubs and whatever and music venues and um, street corners and everywhere you know but there's no experience quite like it it's it's a one it's often a one-on-one -on -one performance with someone you know in a hospital bed and it's you know it's I've said it before it's kind of like a conversation you know uh, you meet somebody you're talking with them and you you have music to offer and it's kind of the first place where i really got a sense for how important music is to people because first of all people will tell you explicitly how important music is and how much they love it and you know about how that song reminds them of this one time when they were you know driving this one place with their their fiance and you know you get all these stories and and people like i i didn't realize what music meant to me until people were telling telling it back to me and I I was hearing things that sounded awfully familiar to me um, but it's it's an incredible program where I get to offer my music and art to people who are who need something like that you said that being in the working in the hospital with patients helped remind you the importance of music to you can you give me an example of that maybe every time someone someone comes up with a story after I play him a song, it makes me think of the songs that take me somewhere. And every time someone, uh, you know, like starts to cry during a song, it makes me think of the songs that make me cry. And, you know, it's people have these very human reactions to music. Um, it's kind of an amazing thing that that, you know, a little bit of sound can provoke these these big feelings in people and does it to me too. And, and I, you know, sometimes I feel like in our, our everyday life, sometimes we don't give it the space to do that. But when you're in a hospital, it's such a vulnerable situation and people are often so vulnerable there that it's almost impossible not to let music move you in some way. Would you say that playing music in the hospital has given you a sense for how music has kind of expanded your awareness for how music functions in communities? Like, uh, a lot of what we've been talking about is community uh, and art and this idea. It sounds, from what you're saying, it sounds like that there's a kind of 
compassion or empathy that's also part of what music can be? Yeah, so um, one thing that strikes me playing for people in the hospital is when I, when I go and play for somebody, music is such a, such a community thing and it's a community builder and people, almost everyone has some story about like, you know, oh, well, my uncle plays guitar and, you know, every time the family gets together, we all sit around and sing songs with my uncle playing guitar and it's such a community thing that people are reminded of the people in their life that play music and the ways in which they enjoy it together. And uh, it's good for that. I mean, everyone thinks there's there's no negative memories associated with that. Like, oh, my, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's, it's like a gathering thing, you know, it's cool. And I know a lot of musicians, myself included, can sometimes think of it as being like an individual pursuit and such a personal thing to put your thoughts into music and songwriting can be such a personal thing. But, but as soon as you let it go out into the world, it suddenly isn't yours anymore. And it's something that can, uh, it's a community thing. Would you say it's given you a chance to experience your, cause I know you play, you play some of your own music for patients. Is that right? In Sometimes. Yeah. Would you say that it's given you, uh, how, what is that like to play somebody to play one of your own songs for somebody in that kind of intimate setting? It can like, be, is a, it nerve wracking? It can be a little nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I mean, on one hand, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been a musician for a long time and, and I've been playing my songs out for people for, you know, over, you know, 15 years or something, 10, 10, 15 years. And, uh, um, there's, there's always like a, a little bit of nervousness when you play a new song for, for a crowd or a person or, um, you know, you want somebody to get something out of it. And so you're nervous going into it because you, you're hoping that you'll get the reaction that you want. And it's, you know, magnified in the hospital because there's a little bit higher stakes. You know, you have a, a person who's like, you want the song to hit them in a certain way because because they're in a vulnerable s- space. And um, if it doesn't, it could be, you know, damaging a little bit. I don't know if that's, <laughs> I don't know if that's right. But, you know, oftentimes I play you my You kind of want to connect with them, I guess. Yeah, is what you want to connect with them and put it, and having, and playing your song for somebody is sort of like, uh, it's sort of like undressing in front of them. You're like, okay, uh, you know, I've sure I've played you uh, a handful of, um, you know, Eagles songs or whatever, but this is actually what I play. <laughs> you know, this is me. Um, and so you're kind of like showing them who you really are musically, which can be a little uh, nerve wracking. Yeah. They're already in a vulnerable situation. Yeah. So you're actually, by making yourself more vulnerable, I mean, we're not art therapists. I, I work in in the hospital too, as an artist in residence and right. a writer in residence. And one of the ideas is we're not therapists. We're mm-hmm. there to humanize the healthcare environment. And so doesn't that in some way kind of make us more human by telling our, our stories in a small way? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, like you said, we're not therapists and, and like all of, all of my visits as a musician, we, we say they're patient led, like, I take requests and ask, ask people what they want to hear and what, what they want me to play. And it's, it's up to the listener, um, what I play and people ask for original songs, you know, pretty often. Um, and it is like a, uh, a way to connect. It's yeah, definitely. It, it kind of, I wouldn't say it makes me as vulnerable as they are, but it definitely, it definitely, uh, evens the playing field a little bit. They get to see a little bit of who I really am, you know, I'm not just playing, you know, a Jimmy Buffett song that I don't like or something, you know. We it's kind of like when you meet somebody. I I kind of think of when I meet a patient, it's kind of like giving them the opportunity to meet a real human being. Like the pe- the the people in the hospital, the pe- the staff are are pretty amazing, the doctors, the medical staff, the doctors, nurses, but they have a very particular job to do. Mm-hmm. And so we're there as a kind of like somebody they might meet at the bus stop or right. just like at the grocery store. Uh, we're not there to treat them in any way or require them to like take medicine or exactly. Yeah. And the staff doesn't have the time to, to be able to, to do what we do anyway. They have, they have all kinds of other things to do. And I know a lot of them wish they could spend the time that we get to spend with patients. Um, but you know, yeah, patients, 
uh, people in the hospital need people in general need that connection and sometimes you're deprived of it when you're in in that kind of situation so it's you know yeah it's human connection have you has working in the hospital uh impacted your songwriting has there been experiences maybe or ideas that have come as a result of working there that you've actually wanted to take outside of the hospital to larger you know groups of people that you play for and clubs right. and bars and- uh well you know it's kind of like i said earlier i'm um i i like telling stories and uh, I get inspired when I'm hanging out with somebody in the hospital and playing music and they're like, and they're telling stories and, you know, people have great stories, even if they don't think they do, or they don't think they've lived an exciting life. People have awesome stories and getting to listen to those, it kind of like, it just sparks something. It's, I, I don't know if my songwriting has changed, but I, I do find myself inspired pretty regularly by the stories people tell. What do you think the, um, the potential for telling stories and narrative has, I guess, particularly through music, has for social change and kind of expanding people's awarenesses, even interpersonally. Yeah, it's a it, you know, it's kind of a simple idea. I feel like uh, it's it's a little well worn, but um, people respond to stories like that. That's how we live. I mean, like our day is a story. That's sort of what we we connect to. Um, so you could read a textbook and, and learn something, or you could hear someone tell a story and, you know, or you could read like for me, I'm, I'm a fiction guy. I like reading nonfiction too, but I'm a fiction guy and I get so much out of a, you know, like a good sci-fi novel that has like these big concepts built into it, but it's not trying to slap you in the face with it. It's not, you know, just exposition. It's, it's actually giving you a story to latch onto and people to care about and events to think about. It's, um... I think it's it's a, a great way to, to to learn something and to to get a point across. Is there a favorite sci-fi book that you're into right now? Um, I I just finished actually this morning. I just finished uh, "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep," and uh, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I'm I'm a I'm a big um, Vonnegut fan too. I think one of my all-time favorite sci-fi novels is uh, "The Sirens of Titan" by Kurt Vonnegut, and I I love the way he like builds these concepts into it and builds this this empathy into it and and this you know heavy meaninglessness into it it's it's really a beautiful beautiful novel that's sometimes hilariously funny and sometimes heartbreakingly sad and and you kind of like run the gamut of emotions and by the end of it you're it's the only book I've ever read multiple times let's just say that <laughs> what are you listening to right now uh, I've been on a, a, a months long rye cooter kick He's uh he's got it all. He's 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 a, a hell of a picker. He's a he's got a he's got a feel for rhythm like very few guitar players I ever hear. Um, yeah, it's it's it hits all the right spots for me. Who are a couple of your uh, old standbys? People you go back to again and again? I'm a, I'm a big Jim Croce fan. Love Jim Croce. Uh, Willie Nelson is one of my all-time favorites. He's a guy who can can really tell you a story, and and break your heart with a guitar solo. And uh, I got a million of them. I mean, I love Paul Simon and Simon and Garfunkel. I'm uh, I'm a big Roger Miller fan. I like the guys uh, and ladies who can. Uh, you know, it's like it's exactly what I said about Kurt Vonnegut. The guy, the people that can break your heart and can make you laugh in the same song. And 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 few people do it like like some of those guys, like Roger Miller's great at that. He could write a heartbreaking ballad and then the goofiest song you've ever heard. And they're back to back on his albums. You know, it's, it's admirable. <laughs> What's the benefit of humor you think in, uh, in music, something you incorporate, I have to say, I think humor is underutilized in, in music and yeah. lyrics. <laughs> I think that it's, I don't, I don't know if, well, I can't speak for everybody, but I can't really trust an artist until I, I like hear a little sense of humor in their music. Why, why do you say that? Because I, people have senses of humor when you talk to somebody like, you know, there, there are people who are just, you know, dour, sad people, but the people that I, that I connect with, like have a sense of humor and it's feels like a little dishonest sometimes when that doesn't come through in the music. It's not, dishonest but 
it's uh you win me over with a little bit of sense of humor yeah i think i'm i think i'm like that too i guess we'll we're gonna wrap up here in a minute i just wanted to leave folks with if you want to sort of talk about any artistic or mu- musical projects that you're working on any upcoming shows that are of note i know that uh you've done a couple of those westerns uh performances mm-hmm. do you have any plans to do any more of those uh or other kinds of i know theater's kind of been something that you've also gravitated towards as a performer yeah the high nooners has been uh it that's the band is called the high nooners it's um it's been a big project a really fun project um you know it's it combines music and songwriting which i've always loved with acting which i'm not great at <laughs> but you know script writing and costumes and prop building and and it's a it's a, a whole big uh glorious fiasco but um we have no dates set for a a next show but we're planning to get pretty weird with the script when we end up writing it and uh it should be fun so maybe keep an eye out for that if folks want to listen to your music where's the best place to do that michaelclater.com it'll take you right to my band camp page you can listen for free or uh you know buy something i don't know any uh any last thoughts i should have a good song to recommend (laughs) Or a book. <laughs> I tell you, you know, I, I played um, for the first time today, uh, I played the Jim Croce song, Walking Back to Georgia. Yeah, I love it's that It's a great song. song. It is a great song. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it on that note. Thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, it's Thank always you. a pleasure talking with yeah, you. Yeah, glad to be here. And uh, take care of yourself. And thanks again. Thanks again to Dylan and Michael, and this is Brandon for the Changeville Podcast, signing off. What I've been wondering is whether or not you see that I can keep these bees and be happy with me, cause I'm happy with